thank you guys for being here. Um, and thank you to Daniel and Arun to be, uh, for being here as well. Um, I cover the gig economy for Fast Company, so this is a topic that I'm very excited to dive into. Um, so Arun is the Harold Price Professor of Entrepreneurship and Professor of Technology Operations and Statistics at NYU Stern School of Business. And he also quite literally wrote the book on flexible work, so who better to have up here? And then Daniel is the chief economist at InstaWork, which is a leading staffing platform for hourly workers and employers, and they actually staffed this event. That's right. <laughs> um, so flexible work has become just a very hot topic in the past couple of years. Um, you know, people have moved online because of the pandemic. People have been changing industries. People have decided they want to get out of the workforce entirely. Uh, so is this something that, the, the type of flexible work we are seeing today, is this something that we've always just slowly been moving toward? Or is how we define and view flexible work as it is today something that COVID created? Arun, you want to take that? Sure. Um, first of all, First off, I mean, thank you for putting this panel together. It's a great topic, and it's nice to be here. Um, I'm really glad that the conference was today and not yesterday. Um, but I, I think we, you know, we lived in a world of flexible work, um, you know, 100, 150 years ago. Um, flexible in that it was far more independent. Um, it didn't involve um, a specific start time, a specific end time, a specific employer, and um, you know a particular salary. Um, it, and over, I guess, sort of the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, we have ended up um, creating a lot of rigidity in what we think of as work. You know, we've organized it in a specific way into these bundles that we call jobs. We sort of people hand over a monopoly over their talent and labor to a company. And in exchange, you get sort of insurance. You get like, you know, a uniform salary every month. Um, so I think we're just sort of returning. Technology is taking us back to, um, you know, reintroducing um, or taking away some of this rigidity from the workplace. Um, and so COVID might have accelerated the shift, um, but it certainly was sort of underway. And you know, I don't think all of the changes that we've seen through COVID are going to be permanent, um, but maybe that's something we can come back to. And uh, I think it's not just the pandemic, but also the period that Aaron's talking about in the second half of the 20th century was also a period where workers lost a lot of bargaining power for different reasons. There was deunionization, so they were competing more with each other. There was offshoring, so they were competing more with workers from around the world. There was automation, so they were competing more with robots and machines. They lost bargaining power because of all those things. And in the meantime, the corporate sector really consolidated. So there were fewer businesses on the other side of the bargaining table, too. And that also made it tougher for workers to assert themselves. And what we've seen in this very tight labor market that's resulted from the pandemic, the people who are still unable to work because of long COVID, people who have decided to get out of the workforce altogether, is that workers have brought some of that bargaining power back, and along with getting higher pay, they're trying to get back some of that flexibility, right? It's another aspect of work that can be returned to the worker increasingly through these technological platforms. And that's true for white collar workers who are working remotely, but also the three million plus workers in our network who do in-person hourly work. Right, yeah, there definitely is so much more power in the hands of the workers now. Um, we, you touched quickly on, or briefly on technology, and as, as we know, it really advanced over the past couple of years as, again, everyone moved online. Um, are we where we should be when it comes to having the technology for a fully flexible workforce, or is there still a lot to be done with that? Um, you, you you know, uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting question, right? Are we where we should be? 
sometimes definitionally the answer is yes. I mean, like, you know, this is, this is, this is where we are. I'm reminded of this, uh, that, that there's, uh, there was a series that uh, followed The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams, sort of science fiction humor, um, uh, which introduced uh, a, a detective who, when he wanted to decide what to do, would follow a car that looked like it knew where it was going. And his theory was that he would not get to where he was planning to get to, but he would get to where he was supposed to be. Um, so this is a sort of a very Zen approach to um, like, you know, sort of choosing, choosing your work. But I mean, in, in, in some ways, um, you know, the, 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 the idea that there's a magic technology that is going to somehow change how we work. Um, and it's the technology that is driving the outcome um, is, is, is often sort of a, a fallacy that people sort of uh, fall victim to. Um, if you look at all the changes that have taken place in how we work through COVID, none of them have really been driven by the emergence of some magic new technology that dramatically improved our ability to work at home or work flexibly, right? I mean, it's all technologies that there, there were other sort of economic, um, institutional and behavioral changes, um, like, you know, institutionalization, acceptance, like, you know, the legitimization of being able to work at home, companies saying, okay, we've got to sort of rebuild our processes around it. And so um, I think technologically we're fine. Um, it's really more about um, changing the way that you know, deciding how much of this do we want to keep. I mean, how many of you work from home at least one day a week? Okay, how many of you like the fact that you can work from home? Okay, so, so this is one side of the issue that there is a push from a certain segment of the workforce that they want this um, arrangement, they, they, this technology-enabled form of work to survive to sort of persist. But there's another side that will also be pushing, which is, um, which is what led to the full-time job in the first place, which is what's the economically most efficient way to organize the work? Right, and that, right? sorry, that, that brings me into my yeah. next point, um, just touching on the broader impact of, uh, or impacts on the economy of flexible work. So how does this, change U.S. economic growth? Are we going to be seeing any gains as people, you know, adopt a flexible model? I, I think that we can see gains in some areas. You know, in our economy, we always have a certain amount of unemployment. And some of it is what we call frictional unemployment, which is just people in the time that it takes to find a new job, you know, just actually going through that matching process. Sometimes that takes a little time. And some of it is what we call structural unemployment, which is where we just don't have the right skills to match up with the workers who are available. We think that online platforms are helping to reduce frictional unemployment by making that matching process faster and more efficient. Okay, taking the workers who are already there, make it faster and more efficient. You know, most of our shifts, which are posted by businesses on our platform, fill up in less than 24 hours. Right? It's, it's almost as though the just-in-time supply chains that we've talked about for the past 30, 40 years have now been joined by just-in-time labor. And you can now you know, modulate your labor supply uh, to match your, the demand for your products and services. But the other thing, the structural unemployment is much harder to deal with. What we do see on our platform is a lot of workers trying to work shifts in different industries, different roles, and they say in our surveys that they actually want to pick up new skills so they have more options in the labor market. If demand drops in one industry, they can go work in another one where they already have experience. That means that we might actually be working on the structural unemployment as well because we have workers who are more versatile. Yeah. Right, right. Um, and I, it, it is different for a platform like yours than, a, than an Uber or a Lyft where someone may have to you know, be driving around for a while before they get that next job. Yeah, and if you're doing Uber or Lyft, which is really gig work as opposed to flexible work in, on, on a shift basis, then you don't know exactly when you're going to get those tasks. You don't have that predictability. But also, you know, there's, if you're an Uber driver, you're always an Uber driver. 
the thing that you're doing is driving a car and there's no career progression. But if you are on a flexible work platform like ours, you can work in a bunch of different industries, but you can also intensify your relationship with the employer. You could start out just working a shift there and it's kind of like try before you buy. And if you have a good experience, the employer might put you on a roster so that you get preferential access to their shifts. Then they might ask you to sign up for a long-term assignment and take shifts over a course of a several months. And then they may actually move to a permanent hire. And, and we see that as a success, right? Because it, it makes our business partners happy because they found somebody that they wanted to hold on to. And it showed the workers that you, know, you can actually use flexible work to end up with the job that you really want. And what's interesting about it, though, is of the workers on our platform who say they want a full-time job, and it's about two-thirds of them, three-quarters of those say they will keep doing flexible work even when they have a full-time job. And, and I, last thing I'll add is that I was at an event a couple weeks ago with some people in the hospitality and food service and food production industries, and one said, you know, we had people in packing plants who were working six days a week. Now they only want to work five days a week for us, but they work that extra day doing flexible work because they could pick up a new skill or build their network or just do it at a time that they prefer in a location that they prefer. And, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, these, these are all good points, Dan. I think that there's, um, you know, you're clearly pointing out that um, depending on what kind of work you do, um, there are very different um, benefits that you get from a platform. Um, I think that one of the, like, you know, I, the, the, there were a couple of thoughts I had as you were sort of laying this out. One is that, um, you know, part of the reason why we're able to sort of see this explosion of flexible and independent work is because the technology has reached the point where you've got these platforms providing the structure, right? I mean, you know, that there's an intermediary who is sitting in the middle and providing the businesses with whatever structure they need or the consumers in the case of like, you know, Uber and, and Lyft. And so that allows a greater level of flexibility downstream with, you know, sort of the individuals who are deciding when they're going to work and like, you know, how they're going to work. And so that provision of structure, I think, is something that all of these platforms bring. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think that driving a car for a living ever had much of a career progression. And so sometimes I feel bad for the Uber Lyft platforms when they're sort of being asked to do the impossible. And you say at the end of the day, there are limits to how much you can pay someone who drives a car for a living. And there's a limit to how much you, career progression you can give them because right. of the nature some, of what they do, Some of the do, platforms, right? in order to attract drivers, though, have been doing things like um, reimbursing for education. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and these, are, these are certainly good benefits. But... Um, you know, just, just one final point I wanted to make on this was that um, we're using flexible in very different ways. Um, there are lots of, you know, um, for, for a while there was sort of a well understood notion that flexibility had to do with, you still had the structure of a job, but you could choose when you began and when you ended, you could choose your shifts, you could choose to work four days rather than five days, maybe you could choose to take time off to sort of be re-educated. And I was thinking about the metaphor I just sort of used about like, you know, the detective and him following the car. And the approach I took there was sort of like self-referential. I wasn't quite sure where I was going with that metaphor. But then once I made it, I was like, okay, I've got to sort of figure out what I need to say next to sort of like, you know, provide some justification for like what I just, um, you know, the, with, with, with the situation that I set up. So that's, that's probably an inefficient level of flexibility for like, you know, sort of for this panel, right? But that's also something that you see in flexible work where people are thinking, well, this means I can work whenever I want, I can do however much work I want. And, you know, so you've got to make the two sort of sides of this thing reconcile because the expectations that we're setting for people on what work is and what flexibility is also have to sort of be realistic and consistent with you know, sort of having the high levels of productivity that have sort of made this economy as big as it has, as big as it is today, right? Yeah, you know, I think you're absolutely right. A lot of those technologies were already developed, like eBay developed the marketplace, for example, which is very similar to what we do. But we're actually hearing people ask us for something different now. They're saying, if I need to produce a certain number of widgets during the week, and I need a certain number of hours, I don't care when the people show up, but I need to make sure I have that number of hours. Can you make that happen for me? And that's kind of taking the flexible work to the next level 
where the employers are willing to accept that flexibility, even take advantage of it relative to that constraint. So that may be the next thing we see. Right, right. I wish we could talk about this for, you know, like another hour, but that is all the time we have. So thank you guys so much for coming and thank you too for joining me up here. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you.